We are uh, finishing up Lamentations this morning, and uh, put this as part two. So um, we're going to start something new next week. We're going to uh, hear the words of Jesus from John's Gospel, and especially the uh, there are seven statements that Jesus makes in John's Gospel about himself. He says, "I am, I am the, uh, the bread of life, the light of the world," and so on. And so we're going to look at those beginning next week. Next week is I Am the Bread of Life from John chapter 6. So um, that will be seven sermons um, from John in the words of Jesus. But this morning we're finishing up uh, Lamentations. And uh, just want to review just, just a little bit just, just to make the point of these main points. But this book is, uh, the majority of it is an acrostic. That means that uh, the first verse of chapter 1 begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The second verse is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And you notice in chapter 1 there are 22 verses and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So it goes from our equivalent of A in verse 1 to the equivalent of Z in verse 22. Aleph to Tav. You notice in chapter 2 you have 22 verses. That's the same thing. It does that every verse. Notice in chapter 3, we don't have 22 verses. We have 66 verses. And so that's three 22-verse sections. And so uh, in chapter 3, verse 1 begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and verses 1 through 3, and then verse 4 begins with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet and so on until we get... So it's three times over. All right, look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, how many verses? Back to 22 again. So we have, again, first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, second letter as it goes down, all the way to the end. Chapter 5, verse 1, uh, we'll look at that in a second, but uh, notice it has 22 verses there. And we expect that to be an acrostic as well, to begin with the first letter and the second letter of the alphabet. But chapter 5 doesn't follow that pattern. It's just... It starts with various letters. doesn't follow the acrostic pattern. So we'll talk about why that is when we get there. But to review a little bit in chapter 1, so some have suggested each of these chapters is a separate lament that, that uh, taken together, it's, it's a lament over the destruction of Jerusalem. Jeremiah prophesied about this. It finally happened. How the city sits, how it sits as a, as a widow and in chapter 1 is about suffering for sin, as we saw last week. And in verse 5, if you look at that again, chapter 1, 5, here's the reason. It's not because Jerusalem didn't have a strong army. It's not because of the economics. The suffering that came upon the city of Jerusalem and upon God's people, in verse 5, we're given the reason. Her adversaries have become her masters. Her enemies are secure for the Lord has caused her grief. So God has done this because of the multitude of her wrongdoings. Her little ones have been taken away or have gone away. And the word for sins there implies outright rebellion before God. So why did this happen? It happened because of sin. And Jeremiah preached that over and over in 30, 40 years of that, over and over. He says, coming, and it came. And so this book tells us it's because of sin. So it is suffering because of sin there in chapter 1. In chapter 2, the writer goes back through some of the same calamities and, and suffering in chapter 1 and uh, is remembering the way it used to be in the past. Healing comes... Uh, through memory, not forgetfulness. And especially remembering this suffering came because of our sin. And remembering is an important part of, of our life, and especially as we go through suffering, remembrance, and recalling, that's an important part. And that's what the writer does here. It's not, um, it's not like, okay, well, everything's going to be better. It's I remember what we used to have. I remember how this is. Uh, I, we have this sorrow now. And so sorrow that comes from remembering the days that are no more. And then in chapter 3, as we said, it's longer than the other chapters in the book, three times as long. Uh, 
It is, as we said, an alphabetic acrostic, like the, uh, many of the other chapters. But it's a triple acrostic. And uh, this is emphasizing, the, the, in Hebrew poetry, it's not rhyme. It's based on parallel lines. But also, there is structure in various narratives. And the middle section is uh, usually the point of it all. And so in this writer's mind, it seems this middle chapter, or roughly middle section, is where he's saying, I can grab on to this. I can hold on to this. So look again at chapter 3 and the passage that was read there. And this is where we were last week. Now we're going to move on from this, but this is a high point of, of this book. But again, it is a light, but it's not a bright shining light. It is some hope, but it would be great if the book ended, say in verse 26, but it doesn't. Why? Because in reality, there's still that lament. There's still that suffering. So the book doesn't end with the statement, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. The book ends in lament. Yet right here in this middle section, which it seems the writer wants to make as, as a major part of this, is this, I have hope in him. And so the writer says in uh, verse 19, to God, remember, or to himself, probably, remember my misery, my homelessness. And my soul certainly remembers this. And I recall this to mine. Therefore, I wait. And then in verse 22, just as we sang, the Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end, for His compassions do not fail. And compassions there is plural. With each new day, there are fresh experiences of God's compassions and His feelings toward the suffering we're going through. And even to wake up in the morning every day is to be reminded of God's love and of his faithfulness and of his good. And this turns into an act of praise from, from this writer. And he teaches that blessings come through waiting on the Lord. Uh, look at verse 25. The Lord is good for those who await him to the person who seeks him. Now, notice... Um, in uh, verse 25, you have the word good. Verse 26, you have the word good. Verse 27, you have the word good. And that's in contrast to the good and in verse 17 that he had lost. So he says, God is good to those who wait for him, who seek him and wait quietly for his salvation. Christians who suffer do more than suffer. They wait expectantly. And it's not passive waiting. That's stoic endurance. That's, that's okay, I'm just going to grip my teeth and I'm going to make it through this. That's not what Scripture is talking about. This is active waiting and it's active resting in the goodness of God with hope that God will deliver me <clears throat> that he is good i know he is good that's the where i'm at that's the bottom line i know he is good but i'm in the middle of this suffering now and yet i know that he is good to those who wait and there are times that that's only that's the only thing that a sufferer can do is wait for god but waiting is good because salvation will come and he praises god then for his faithful mercies um, and in the verses that follow, as I said, he returns back to the lamenting. But he also is trying to wrestle with this and struggle with this and offer uh, how... See, the, uh, one of the big problems we face as humans in the world is God is good, God is all-powerful, yet we suffer. Now, sometimes we suffer because... But the ultimate cause of suffering is sin, but suffering doesn't, we suffer not just because of our, our own personal sins, we may suffer because somebody else's sins. And so with that, you have the innocent sufferer. So that's the big 
problem, the problem of suffering. In fact, one writer called this the rock of atheism. If God is good and God is all powerful, why is there suffering? And we're talking about undeserved suffering, the suffering of the innocent. If God is good and God is all powerful, why do little babies suffer? Well, we live, again, in a, in a world that's been affected by sin, but those little babies didn't do anything to cause that. Now, and we can, you know, we suffer sometimes because we make bad choices. We choose to not listen to God. But then we suffer because of the sins of others. I mean, um, for instance, if somebody gets drunk and they get in a car and they drive 100 miles an hour and they run off the road and they hit a tree... Um, they they will suffer because of that. They're suffering, but it's a bad choice they made to get drunk, get in a car, and drive 100 miles an hour. But suppose somebody else gets in a car, gets drunk, and drives 100 miles an hour, and then crosses over and hits a family, and that family, maybe even with young children, they suffer. They're not suffering because of some choice that they made. They're suffering from the stupid choice that somebody else made. And we wrestle with all kinds of scenarios like that in the world. So if God is all-powerful, God is all-loving, why is there suffering? And the bottom line is we don't have all those answers, but we do know God is good. We do know that God is faithful. And we struggle with those things. Now, people have suggested various ways of viewing this. It's like we had a beautiful tapestry that we hang on the wall, and we see it's just, just beautiful. But you look on the back of that, and you don't see any kind of pattern. You see all kind of threads. Just, you know, there's, there's no kind of a pattern that you could determine from that. And many times as we look at life, we're seeing that. There's not, there's not that pattern. But on the other side, there is this beautiful picture. So like we sing, we'll understand it better by and by. And we trust God that God is good. God is all-powerful. And God also has entered into the suffering situation. He knows what it means. He knows what it feels because He sent His Son who suffered and died, not because of anything He did, not because of His sin, but because of ours. And so He understands completely that. You probably have heard of a book. It's called, um, well... Why do bad things happen to good people? It's written by a rabbi, Rabbi Harold Kushner. It's a pretty old book now. But um, this uh, rabbi had a child who was uh, suffering from, uh, I think, I don't know the technical name, but I think premature aging or something. And he, he wrestled with this idea. If God is all good and God is all powerful, why is my child suffering? And the conclusion that Kushner came is that God is all-loving, but God is not all-powerful. He wishes he could do something, but he can't do it. His hands are tied. Now, I don't think that Scripture upholds that conclusion, that, that God is not all-powerful. Scripture is saying God is all-powerful, and he can stop. He could step in. And sometimes we try to make you know, distinctions and, and say, well, God doesn't, didn't cause it. No, certainly Many times he, he doesn't, but he can stop it. And so we're still back to this problem then. If God is all good and God is all powerful, why is there suffering? And we don't have the final answer in, in Scripture. Now, what this writer is doing, he's wrestling with all of that. But one, one thing we can say is if this life were all there is, we weren't uh, promised anything after this, this would be a greater problem than what it, what it is. There is a solution to this problem. We just don't see it now. God, God knows it. He, he holds it, and we trust Him. We trust His goodness. We trust His power. And so we'll understand it better by and by. But the writer here, as he's waiting in this suffering, has brought insights. And he says, um, as was read in verse 26, it's good that he waits silently for the salvation of the, of the Lord. It's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit silently. Let him contemplate this. Now, regardless of the reasons for suffering, suffering is always an opportunity to learn. Uh, it's always an opportunity to grow closer to God. Uh, you know, the famous book in the Hebrew Scriptures is Job about suffering. 
and uh, Job um, is suffering greatly, and he's suffering because of God. And the friends show up, and they can't grasp it, and they say, "You must have you've sinned in some way, Job, to bring this upon yourself." And I think they know how righteous Job is, and they know maybe they're not even as 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 good person as Job is, and they're there's they're afraid. If this can happen to Job, then this can happen to me. So they're holding on to this theology that you must have suffered somewhere. Now. Uh, what's amazing is the theology that those friends put forth that you suffer because you sin. So you're suffering, it's because you've sinned. That comes straight out of Proverbs. Over and over you have that. And it's true, but it's generally true. It's general truth. Uh, sometimes those who turn away from God, who sin blatantly in this world, they do suffer. But many other times, those who turn away from God don't suffer in this world. They prosper. And, and there are writers of Scripture, Psalm 73, uh, the author of that, he's struggling with that. I don't see. And he said, I almost lost my faith about this. But again, Job, so Job's friends say, you're suffering because you've, t you've sinned in some great way. Confess your sin and you'll be healed. And Job says, I'm not saying I'm sinless, but I haven't sinned to deserve this. I mean, come on. And throughout, he maintains his innocence. And he boldly asks God. Now, at the end of the book, Job says, I've heard about you with my ear, but now my eyes see you. So through the whole process, Job has come to a greater knowledge of God. Good can come from suffering. So that's what this writer is saying here. And he says in verse 27 through 33 that uh, <clears throat> we're not cast off forever. Verse 31, the Lord is not rejected forever. If he causes grief, then he will have compassion in proportion to his abundant mercy, he says. Yet he recognizes that they must suffer because God is just. God, in verse 34 through 36, God is a, is a God of, of justice. So when suffering is deserved because of sin, it ought to produce confession to God and petition to God as we turn away from sin that God will be with us, will examine us. When we say we have sinned and we ask for His Forgiveness In verses 48 through 51, it even goes beyond words into tears. And this sorrow that, that we feel here. Yet, throughout this, there is joy in that confession. Look at um, the last uh, couple of verses. Look at verse 55 and following. I called on your name, Lord, out of the lowest pit. You have heard my voice. Do not cover your ear from my plea for relief. From my cry for help, you came near on the day I called to you. You said, do not fear. Lord, you have pleaded my soul's cause. You have redeemed my life. Lord, you've seen my oppression. Judge my case. After this reassurance that God will hear, then chapter 3 ends with uh, a cry for vengeance. And that's verses 58 through 66. And we're not going to read all the, the, these, these passages that are here, but uh, it's a cry for God's justice against Israel's enemies. You grant mercy to those who are suffer, uh, suffering, then he's asking for God to carry out his mercy against those who oppress. You took up my case, you redeemed my life, he said. You've seen, but and you've heard their insults. And so look at um, verse 58. Uh, and following. So he says, verse 63, look at their sitting, they're rising, they're mocking, but I know you will repay them, O Lord. You will give them shamelessness of heart. Your curse will be on them. And these kind of passages are difficult for us. What do we do with these passages? Um, there are Psalms, whole Psalms that have to do with this. 
But what he's doing is leaving judgment in God's hands. But he's saying, you see it. You see how they mock you and they, they mock me. And so I'm asking for you to act. All right, that's chapter three. And we have two more chapters and we're going to run through this. And I want to close with something important at the end of chapter five. But chapter four <clears throat> is about a failure of leadership. So he says that uh, it opens with a comparison. Gold has become uh, dark. It's lost its luster. It's um, sacred gems are just scattered out in, in the street, he says. But more precious than the gold, and they saw that in the treasures of the temple, but more precious than that are the people of Jerusalem. In verse two, the precious sons of Zion, they're just broken like a, the, uh, pots of clay. And you remember earlier in Jeremiah, Jeremiah goes to the potter's house and he purchases a clay jar and then he smashes it into a thousand pieces. And he says, this is what God is going to do. That's what God did. This is fulfilled. Um, there's a horrible description of the suffering they're, they're going through. He, uh, he says the children in verse four, the tongue and the infant clings to the roof of his mouth because of thirst. Children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. He, uh, he says that uh, in verse 8, their appearance is darker than soot. They're not recognized in the streets. Their skin is shriveled on their bones. It's dry. It's become like wood. It's, it's like the living are envying the dead as they're searching for food. People are reduced to like walking skeletons. Even you couldn't realize them, uh, recognize them because um, their skin's blackened from malnutrition and exposure. Uh, children died in their, their mother's hands. Then what really stands out, he says, this, the Lord did this. God did this. Look at verse 11 of chapter 4. The Lord has expended His wrath. He's poured out His fierce anger. He's kindled a fire in Zion. It has consumed its foundations. So Jerusalem is suffering at the hands of God's justice. Now to be more specific, it's because of their leaders. It's a lack of leadership. Let's read verses 12 and 13 of chapter 4. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the inhabitants of the world, that the adversary and the enemy would enter the gates of Jerusalem. <clears throat> because of the sins of her prophets and the wrongdoings of her priests, who have shed in her midst the blood of the righteous. So why does this happen? It happened in chapter 1, verse 5, because of sin. To be more specific, it happened because of the sins of the leaders. Now, it's not the only sins, but it happened because of the sins of their spiritual leaders. The prophets had sinned. They left people starving for God's word. They weren't giving God's word. Only Jeremiah is a true prophet. The priest had shed innocent blood. There's bribe. You bribe, you know, accepting bribes. The Lord scattered them. So the, the leaders are not leading. The king had failed. The king was to be a spiritual leader in Israel. But he's trying to work deals with Egypt and all these other nations to protect political deals. And... They, they're, they're suffering because of the sin of their leaders. And in the end, as we saw, the king was betrayed into the hands of his enemies. They run out at night, try to escape Jerusalem, and then the army overtakes them. Verse 20, the breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, that's the king, was captured in their pits of whom we had said, in his shadow we shall live among the nations. What they learned is the futility of, of political solutions to spiritual problems. And that's something that I think at our time and these months that we are in, we have to remember God is still king. And as we're facing political decisions, the answer is not found in political answers. And we should do the best that we can in, in voting for uh, those that we think uphold the principles of God's word and um, are good political leaders. 
but God is the king. And see, the Israel thought, well, if we have good, uh, strong leaders, then we're all right, we're safe. But they're still living in sin. And so it was a failure of their leaders. The kings had become apostates. The prophets no longer spoke for God. The priests were abusing uh, their work. And so ultimately, the kind of leadership that they're looking for is only found in Christ. He's prophet, priest, and king. Now, the fourth lament ends on a hopeful note. Look at verse 21. And that's Israel's oldest enemy would be defeated. Rejoice and be joyful. In the middle of the whole lament, rejoice and be joyful. Well, what could cause this? Daughters of Edom who lives, live in the land of Uds, but the cup will pass to you as well. You'll become drunk and expose yourself. The, the uh, punishment of your wrongdoing has been completed, daughter of Zion. He'll no longer exile you, but he will punish your wrongdoing, daughter of Edom. He will expose your sins. And Edom and Israel had a long history, and it, uh, and it even goes back. I mean, um, Israel descends from Jacob, and Edom descends from Esau. And they were two brothers, and there was the strife between the brothers, and then there's strife between the nations. And Edom had, had done some terrible things to Israel. But God holds them accountable. So we come to the last chapter in this book of Lamentations, and it is a prayer for renewal. And it's not, as one writer said, not so much a lament, but a prayer. It's a prayer of last desperation. For times when, when everything has failed and in the middle of suffering, what do you pray? <clears throat> and we talked about how that this last chapter has 22 verses and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, but it doesn't follow the same acrostic pattern. And maybe that's reflected. The uh, reason it doesn't do that is because it's not any kind of a pattern. It reflects the disorder that is around them in, in the city. Now, some people suggest, well, it's a rough draft and it was supposed to be an acrostic. The writer just didn't, didn't get to doing the final edit on that. It's hard to believe that it made it into this book and it didn't get the final edit. Uh, I think another possibility, as I said, is that it's not an acrostic in a book that has four chapters. So four out of five chapters are acrostics, and yet this chapter is not. Why not? Because it's disorder. It's reflecting the disorder, <clears throat> the chaos. And it begins with, verse 1, with an appeal to God. Remember, Lord, what has come upon us. Look and see our disgrace that appeal is followed again by a rehearsal of all the suffering that they've gone through you see that over and over in this book our inheritance goes to strangers our house is to foreigners we become orphans without fathers our mothers are like widows we have to pay for our drinking water we have to pay for our wood that we burn our pursuers are at our necks. We are worn out. We're given no rest. We have submitted to Egypt and Assyria to get enough bread. Our fathers' sin are gone, and we are burdened with this. Slaves rule over us. There's no one to rescue us from their hand. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin has become as hot as an oven because of the ravages of hunger. They violated the women in Zion, the virgins in the cities of Judah. Leaders have rung, are wrung by their hands. Elders were not respected. Young men worked at the grinding mill and youth staggered under the loads of wood. Elders are absent from the gate. So he just goes back through all the suffering again. And then in verse 14 through 18, he says there's joy is gone from life. Verse 14, elders are absent from the gate, young men from their music. The joy of our hearts has ended. Our dancing has turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us for we have sinned. 
Because of this, our heart is faint. Because of these things, our eyes are dim. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl around it. There's no music. There's no joy. And especially among many of the Jewish feasts, they were associated with joy and song and dance because it's joy in the Lord. That's gone. Now they spend um, 70, roughly 70 years in Babylon. Uh, one of the Psalms, Psalm 137, talks about the Babylonians are taunting them and saying, won't you sing some of those songs you used to sing back there when you go to the temple? And they say, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land? We don't have that joy. Just all the uh, uh, hope is gone from them. So music and joy are gone. And yet the writer ha knows this. Look at verse 19. That God is still in control. You, Lord, rule forever. Your throne is from generation to generation. So as we look at our world, <clears throat> and we may see chaos, we see disorder, we see it in government, we see it in uh, all around us, we see moral degradation, yet we can say God is still in control. God's in control. And this writer, as he's suffering, just picture just somebody sitting in a city and the whole city's burned down around them and there are people just wandering around looking for food and little children are starving to death and then the writer is just sitting there and you walk up to him and you stand there and then he says God is still in control and he may be be crying lamenting weeping over this but he says you Lord rule forever do you hear him look to heaven and say you Lord rule forever your throne is from generation to generation. God is still in control. But he has a question. Look at verse 19, uh, 20. Why will you forget us forever? Why do you abandon us for so long? Restore us to you, Lord, so that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you've utterly rejected us and are exceedingly angry with us. And that's the way the book ends. That's not really certainty. That's saying, except you rejected us forever. It, um, Lamentations is uh, one of the books that, smaller books that's read at uh, Jewish festivals today. And uh, in synagogue, when this book is read, it's customary uh, in many synagogues to, um, to read verse 21 and verse 22, but then to go back and the closing reading is verse 21, not verse 22. So in many synagogues, it reads this way, verse 21. Restore us to you, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. Unless you've utterly rejected us and are exceedingly angry with us, restore us to you, Lord, so that we may be restored. Renew our days as of all. See, that ends on a more positive note than the way the book does. That's not the way the book ends. The book ends with that lament, with, with that question. And that question sort of hangs in the air, but it's still a prayer for restoration and, and renewal. Now, we have the answer to that, and the answer is found in Scripture, and that God has sent Messiah. The answer is the atoning work of Christ. And so, is God utterly rejecting us? Is He exceedingly angry with us? He has sent His Son, and the Son paid the price. And God accepts that sacrifice. And that, that propitiates, satisfies that anger of God. The Imitation Songs 356, Jesus is tenderly calling. Lamentations is a difficult book. It's a difficult book you can't just go through and say, okay, well, here are the three main points and all that and live better for Christ this week. It's, it's a lament. And uh, there is that high point in chapter 3 that I'll trust in the Lord, but still there's the honesty and the realism 
that they're suffering. And that's real for us. We might not have been through anything like this, but we do have personal suffering. We live in a world where we struggle with all this. Yet, again, we don't have all the answers, but we do know that God loved us and He gave His Son to die for us. If you're not a Christian this morning, that's the answer. Turn to Him. Repent of your sins. Confess His name. Be baptized. As you're trusting in Him, for you then to live is Christ. He, he's living in you. If you've done that and you've wandered away and you're trying to solve the world's problems on your own and your problems on your own, you won't be able to do it. The answer is only in Messiah. And He calls us to come back and put faithful trust in Him. We're here to help you. We're praying and uh, we pray you'll come while we stand and sing.